If you have your Bible, and I pray that you do, either here or at home, I want to ask you to take your Bible and turn with me to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 33. And uh, as you're turning, I, I want to be the first one to encourage you and remind you that uh, uh, there are many passages in Scripture that, quite honestly, are difficult. Have you ever read some passages of Scripture that are just plain difficult? Sometimes they're difficult to, uh, to grasp, they're difficult to understand, but then there are other times where the Word of God is difficult just simply because what we read is hard to digest. It's hard to stomach sometimes. Some of the things that we see in God's Word, and uh, I, I can uh, just going to say uh, that's probably the case this morning with our text. A little bit hard to digest, but uh, I think very needful nonetheless. And uh, I would be derelict in my duty if we didn't cover the whole counsel of God. And so as we enter our time in God's Word this morning, I'm fully aware, I'm fully aware, fully prepared, that the verbal amens, can I hear an amen just one? Amen. Thank you, because I'm guessing that they're all going to be replaced with nonverbal oh my's the rest of this morning. So I just want to be able to, to say we all in unison said amen uh, at least once today. And uh, we didn't walk out of here with a bunch of nonverbal oh my's. Look with me. Let's jump right into our text. Ezekiel chapter 33, beginning in verse 1 of the precious word of God. And the Bible says, again, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, when I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword to come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and he took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take away any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. And when I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. But thou hast delivered thy soul. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word today. God, we thank you for the opportunity that we have had to hear about how we can trust you. Lord, how we've sung about your great faithfulness and your amazing grace this morning. Lord, as we've been reminded that you are the only reason whereby we have gathered together this morning to celebrate, to worship in the name that's above every name. Lord, I pray that as we draw some principles from a very old passage of Scripture, Lord, I pray that our eyes would be enlightened. Lord, I pray that the Word will fall upon the good soil of our hearts. Lord, I pray that we'll be pricked in our hearts to do more for you. Lord, that we will walk according to your word. We will walk according to your way. We will walk according to your divine will for our lives. Lord, I pray that if there's somebody watching online, somebody in this room that is here and they're still yet to make a spiritual connection with you, God, Lord, I pray that today that you would make it abundantly clear through your word and through the wooing of your Holy Spirit that until they have a relationship with you through Jesus, they still must be warned. Lord, I pray that for those who are here that have already placed their faith and trust in Jesus, God, I pray that we will be 
renewed in our desire, renewed in our commitment to be your watchman. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you in advance for what you'll do through your holy word. And the people of God join together and we declare this by saying amen and amen. Well, here we see God speaking in the Old Testament and uh, certainly don't want to do a disservice to the passage, but I think we can draw some principles out for our time even today in 2021. And we see God speaking to Ezekiel about the role to his people. And as you may or may not know, Ezekiel was a priest, but Ezekiel was unable to fulfill the, the roles and responsibilities typical of a priest because God had called Ezekiel to ministry during a time when God had uh, uh, allowed his children to be taken away into captivity into Babylon. And yet, God calls Ezekiel into ministry. Yes, because of the sinfulness, because of the idolatry of the people, it was a very different time when Ezekiel ministered. And, and so there, the people of Judah, it's a dark time. They're in the midst of exile. And if we were to go back to Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse number 17, you would actually find back there that God had already called Ezekiel to this role as a watchman. Now, for those who have served in the military, militarily speaking, when we consider the task of a watchman, uh, uh, in the Old Testament, we even see it. A watchman would place themselves high upon the city wall or up on a tower. And, and I remember years ago when I was in the military and being placed on watch, guard watch, in the middle of the night and, and wondering, why am I out here in the middle of the night? Who is going to come? Who is going to go? And, and on and on. But the role and the duty of a watchman was still very, very apparent to watch out carefully for the attacks of any enemy. If anyone approached, the watchman was supposed to take up the trumpet, as we see here in Scripture. They were to take up the shofar, if you please, that's pictured here in the slide. And they were to blow the, the trumpet and to warn the people of oncoming danger. A watchman's service was and still is a matter of life. And death. If the watchman failed to see an enemy attacking, or if the watchman decided, you know what, I just don't feel like blowing the trumpet today. I just don't feel like sounding the alarm. Invariably, people would perish. But if the watchman diligently and faithfully executed his or her duty, the lives of many could be spared. Obviously, when I look at Scripture, I see that a watchman had to be someone who was trustworthy. Do you know here, sir, ma'am, young person, that if you have placed your faith in the risen Savior of the world, God has counted you trustworthy. He has counted you trustworthy with a precious gift. A watchman, thank you, a watchman is also someone who understood the significance and the purpose of their role. A watchman is someone who gave themselves completely, totally to their task or to their mission, if you please. I remember the first day I showed up, I was in the Marine Corps, and I showed up to Camp Lejeune, and I, I must preface it by saying, here I came highly touted from San Antonio, Texas, the honor graduate, if you please, from military police law enforcement school. I showed up, I had been meritoriously promoted in San Antonio, Texas. I arrived at Camp Lejeune, got my boots shined, my camouflage utilities pressed. I mean, I'm walking and I'm talking and I'm like, ready for duty. Yeah. The master gunnery sergeant who was in charge of the details that day, he said, uh, Lance Corporal. Man, I was Lance Corporal. Woo -hoo. I thought I was something. You know where he put me? He said, I need you to go outside the fence line. You see, I was a prison guard, military prison guard at that point. He said, I need you to go outside the fence line. And he said, we're going to send the prisoners out into the yard and they're going to have rec, uh, recreation time. I said, aye, sir. Went out there and as fate would have it, it was a hot July day. And the longer I stood at parade rest, the more I sweat. The longer I stood there, the more my eyes started to, 
do this. I was the watchman. I'm the one on duty. I'm the one supposed to be watching to make sure nothing inappropriate takes place. I'm to be watching to make sure the prisoners don't escape and that nobody tries to get any type of contraband to the prisoners. I fell asleep. <laughs> Honor graduate, Lance Corporal, reporting for duty. I fell asleep on my feet. You know, you're pretty tired if you fall asleep standing up. I had been running myself ragged. How many people run yourself ragged today? Hey, let me ask a question. How many of you feel like you ran ragged right now? You're, you're like, I, if I don't stand up, I'm going to fall asleep, right? I stood there, arms back, chest out. Now, I probably wasn't snoring, but I was breathing heavy, no doubt. And I, I don't know how long it took for them to figure out I was sleeping because they have cameras everywhere. But all of a sudden... On the radio that I had clipped to my belt, I hear, Wake up! <laughs> and I literally open up my eyes, and the guards inside of the gate are standing there, just shaking their head. Now, these are guys that are what we would consider in the Marine Corps a little bit salty. They had been around the block a few times. I was never so embarrassed in all my life. First day of duty, honor graduate, really thought I was something, fell asleep. I was derelict in my duty. The task of a watchman can be thankless. To be honest with you, it can be even unwelcomed at, time because, at times because see in Scripture uh, it says that the watchman is to blow the trumpet, to sound the alarm. And quite honestly, friends, can I tell you, there are times when we don't want to hear the alarm, do we? But God had called Ezekiel to be the spiritual watchman for his people. And his job was to blow a warning. And, and even if the people didn't want to hear it, he was supposed to blow the warning. And folks, I will tell you, God has called me to blow the warning. He's called me to sound the trumpet. And not every Sunday can I just say, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. And that is true, Jesus loves you. But sometimes I have to sound the warning because as I look around and I see what's taking place, it doesn't seem if anybody is concerned with sounding the warning. The Bible says in 2 Timothy, speaking of our collective roles and responsibilities, but more specifically even me, as a minister of the gospel in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse number 1, the apostle. Ready. You got to be looking. You got to be searching. You got to be watching as a watchman and be ready to preach the word. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Because Paul understood a time will come, verse 3. When they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. Folks, we're there. We're there. I know there's a lot of churches running up and down the world, uh, up and down the road, and I know a lot of them run a lot more than Battlefield Baptist Church. But I can tell you, as I was telling the folks Wednesday night, sometimes I get online. I'm not a... Uh, 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 the greatest at technology, but I know enough to search up different ministries. And you know what I do? I click on these ministries, and some of them are pretty famous. And I watch to see how long it is before the pastor or the preacher or the teacher that day gets into the Word of God. If all that person is doing is talking about their own feel-good, fancy-free thoughts, I don't want any part of it. I need the Word of God. It's the Word of God and the Spirit of God that's going to change my life. By the way, discipleship is a part about it. I heard this this morning. It's real good. Our onward discipleship journey is all about God sifting. Sifting our mind, sifting our heart. You remember like grandma. I remember my grandma used to have a sifter, the old school kind. You know, it was metal and it had like a wooden handle on that thing. And it'd be like, and you'd pour the flour in there and you'd be like, hey, hey, hey. 
I don't even know. I, I, we don't sift anymore. What's the problem? But, uh, did our flour get that much better? I, I have no idea. I'm not, I'm not a flour connoisseur. But I remember I, we used to sift the, the flour. In fact, I remember sifting pancake mix. It'd be like, and that invariably that thing would get caught. Do you know that that's what God wants to do through His Word and through His Spirit in my life and in your life? Verse 4, it says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch... Thou. Paul was telling Timothy, he says, you're a watchman. He says, watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. It's not going to be easy, Timothy. It's going to be hard. You're going to face and you're going to suffer things. And you're going to come across things that aren't going to be nice. But he said, he said, listen, endure these afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Oh, friends, yes, I have a calling to be a watchman. But friends, God's word, God's word also makes it abundantly clear that every one of us as believers has been given the same task. Hence the title. We are watchmen. Every one of us. We are all watchmen. I said on Wednesday night, we were looking at 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2, and I was telling the folks on Wednesday night that we are to be true ministers of a true message. We don't change the message. We don't add to the message. We don't subtract from the message. And we're to walk in truth as we share the message with people. In fact, hold your place where you're at in Ezekiel 33 because I want us to look at a couple verses back there again. But flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want you to see something and then you can flip right back, I promise. Look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and if you get there, shout out amen. amen. All right, now drop down and look with me at verse 17. See, I'm trying to get amens any way we can get them today. All right, now look down at verse 17. All right, the Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Look at verse 18. And all things are of God. Remember that, just that phrase, just remember today, all things are of God, okay? Who hath reconciled us by him, to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing or not counting their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now look at the very first phrase in verse 20. Now then, or therefore, some of your versions may say, now then, or therefore, since all of this, I just got done telling you, you're a new creature in Christ, you now have a ministry of reconciliation. God has reconciled you to himself through Jesus Christ. You have this wonderful relationship with God. Now, therefore, because of all those things, God gave you a job. Because God, in his great mercy... As Colby mentioned when he prayed, Ephesians 2, 4, because he was rich in mercy, he gave you this ministry of reconciliation. Now he says that you and I, not just the pastor, not just the staff, not just the lay leader, every one of us are now, he says, ambassadors for Christ. But pastor, I don't want to be an ambassador. I don't like it. Well, there are a lot of things I don't like either. But God didn't ask me. He said, I saved your miserable, rotten soul from an eternity separated from God. Guess what? You're now my ambassador. You're now my representative. You're now to go into all the world and preach the gospel. You're now to go and live a life of holiness. You're to live a life blameless before men and women. You're to live a life separated unto God. He didn't ask me if I wanted to. He just said, guess what? This is your job. You're a watchman. You're my ambassador now. Can I tell you that God uses every believer? Not just me. He uses every believer to make his appeal to the world. Now think about that internally. Don't think about your brother, your sister, your husband, or your wife, or your son, or your daughter, or your grandchildren, or grandma, or grandpa, auntie, or uncle, or whatever. Think about that for yourself. 
God uses every believer in his plan, in his program of redemption to appeal to the world. So then you have to ask the question. I have to ask the question, what type of appeal am I making? Oh, we are watchmen. We are watchmen. You see in Matthew 5 and verse number 14, Jesus has declared that as believers, we are all the light of the world. He continued by stating that a city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. In James chapter 5, in verse 19 and 20, God's word instructs us all by saying this. Watch this. It says, brethren, if any of you do error from the truth, James is talking about through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that if you and I err doctrinally from the truth, in other words, speculatively by embracing error or practically by actually practicing error, he says this. He says, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, or turn him from air. By the way, I don't convert anybody and neither do you. But God will use you to speak into the life of somebody else and say, Hey brother, hey brother, what are you doing? You're not walking with the Lord. I got to come alongside of you. And you know what we typically do? We say, well, I don't like that. I don't want my brother or sister to correct me. Do you know that God uses your brothers and sisters sometimes to give you a little holy pinch? A little wake-up call. A little holy tap on the shoulder. Hello. That's what he does sometimes. It says, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, turn him from the air. Look at verse 20. Let him know that he which converteth or directed the sinner from the air of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. That's what we were talking about a couple weeks ago. Love covers a multitude of sins. And love compels us to tell people what's right and what's not. Oh yes, we're watchmen. The questions simply become what kind of watchmen are we? Are we and are we doing and how are we doing in our role as God's spiritual warning system? Have you ever watched TV? Anybody? All right. I was just checking. Have you ever watched TV and you're really engrossed in a program? Anybody ever gotten really engrossed? And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it's like, and the screen blanks out, and it's like the emergency broadcast system. This is a test of the, you know what I do? I literally, as soon as that thing goes, I'm like, I start hitting that remote to turn down that, that squelching sound. Have you ever done that? Anybody? Am I the only one that turns that down? I'm like, oh, no, I'm like this. Turn it down, turn it down. Let me ask you this. Has anybody ignored it? When they come on this emergency broadcast system, we're like, all right, time to go get some more iced tea. Anybody done that? Uh, bathroom break. I'm going to do that. A couple weeks ago, we were sitting there engrossed. Listen, you guys got to pray for me. <laughs> Please pray for me. <laughs> My life has become a series of Hallmark movies. Why are y'all clapping? I have no help. The boys are grown and moved out. I'm, I'm outnumbered, as they say. I've got my wife and my mother-in-law living at the house. You think I get a hold of the remote anymore? No. Well, we were sitting there watching, weren't we, babe? We were watching, and all of a sudden, it's like, boom, 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 emergency broadcast system. I was about ready to exit stage left, and it changed, and the screen said, Amber Alert, Amber Alert, Amber Alert. It was a little girl that had been abducted from Henry County, Virginia, down where we're from, Martinsville, Henry County. And we watched. And immediately I started praying. I immediately started praying that they would find this little girl and that this girl would be okay and that no harm would come to her. I immediately started thinking about my brother who's a sheriff, deputy sheriff down in in that area, and I started thinking about, was he involved in trying to search for this, 
this girl. We are all watchmen. We've been given a job to do. Today as we look around, as we look around and we see what's taking place, quite honestly, I don't know about you, but sometimes I just have to wonder why. Lord, why are you allowing these things to take place? But notice back in our text in Ezekiel 33 what God says to Ezekiel. He says in verse 1 and 2, he says again, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, this is verse 2, Speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman. Now, did you catch it? Because right there, right after the first couple of phrases, God tells Ezekiel, he says, Hey, look, when I bring the sword upon the Lord, in other words, I'm going to be the one bringing it. Because of sinfulness, because of disobedience, I'm going to bring the sword of discipline, so to speak. And he says, when I bring it, he says, you got to make sure that there's a watchman in place to warn the people because at the same time, I, I am a just God. I am a holy God. I am a righteous God. I'm also a loving God. I'm also a God who is rich in mercy. Therefore, I don't want people to perish. I want them to be warned and I want them to turn from their wicked ways. Hello? Spiritual application 2021. Ezekiel's day doesn't seem so unfamiliar from our day. As we look down in verse number 11, you say, well, I didn't read that in the passage. Where does God want them to change? Well, look down at verse number 11 in Ezekiel chapter 33. God says, now say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Folks, that's God's desire. He wanted people then and He wants people now to stop walking in wickedness and to look and to live, much like He said in Numbers chapter 21. You remember it said, raise up the serpent. And when they look on the serpent, they can live. It's the same thing He told Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He said, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, raised up. Oh, my friends, we have to be watchmen. And because God is so merciful, He permits us to be watchmen. He asks us to sound the alarm. Yes, today the watchman, the warning system, if you please, is you. The warning system, if you please, is me. God has not chosen to send a band of angelic beings floating around to tell people or to warn people. Guess what? He sent you and I, maybe angels unaware, to warn people. Instead, He uses us, fallen, sinful people who have been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb to go tell people that they need to have a relationship with Jesus. Oh, it's amazing to think about how God saves us. How He not only saves us, but He leaves us. And sometimes He moves us. Do you know He moved us to Missouri for a while and then He moved us back? But wherever you're from, wherever you are now, God has strategically placed you here for a purpose. You say, well, I'm from Kalamazoo. Well, congratulations. But you live in Northern Virginia right now. God wants you to be a watchman right here in Northern Virginia. Doesn't mean you can't be a watchman back in Kalamazoo and call your friends, your family, all those that you know back there and warn them and tell them about Jesus. But He wants you to do the same right here in Northern Virginia. Oh, listen. There's a couple of basic thoughts that I see from our passage. And before we close, I'm simply going to share them with you. Number one, as watchmen, I know this sounds simple, but we must watch. <laughs> You're like, oh, oh, well, that was real high theologically. Well, if you hang around with me too often, you'll realize that I don't keep the cookies very high. I like to get cookies too. And so I keep them on the bottom shelf. As watchmen, we must watch. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 of our passage says, And when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. Look at the first phrase. When he seeth. We first have to see what's going on before we're able to sound any type of warning. And here's a spiritual thought. We cannot watch out for others unless we know what the dangers are ourselves. You can't watch out for somebody else spiritually unless you know the dangers spiritually yourself. The Old Testament gives all type of examples about the watchmen and their roles and being high up in different places. Think about it, the battle when Absalom is killed. 
There's an example in, in 2 Samuel chapter 18 where the watchman goes up, you remember? And the watchman's able to see the men running towards the city gate and he's able to, to send word down to King David and, and also to send word to the gatekeeper to let the person in because the person's coming with crucial information about the battle. And in 2 Kings chapter 9, there's another example of a watchman during the time of King Joram. Uh, and, and he's positioned high on this tower in Jezreel. And, and he's able to see and to be able to alert those when the enemy is approaching. Clearly, the first role of any watchman is to watch. We must keep our eyes open. I put in my notes, we must keep our eyes open so that we can properly see that roaring lion. You know the roaring lion, right? That walks about seeking whom he may devour. Oh, my friends, we got to stay awake. Because when you least expect it, when you, when you least think he's going to show up, oh, there he comes. He's right after you. He's seeking whom he may devour. Oh, we have to remain awake and keep our eyes open to see. Amos chapter 3 and verse number 6. The Bible says, shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people be not afraid? God uses this analogy over and over in Scripture of blowing the trumpet, sounding the alarm. In Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 5 and 6, oh, God tells Jeremiah, declare ye in Judah and publish in Jerusalem and say, blow ye the trumpet in the land, cry, gather together and say, assemble yourselves and let us go into the defense cities. Set up the standard toward Zion. Retire, stay not. And that phrase there simply means that we're to gather ourselves together and let's go. And then it says, for I will bring evil from the north and great destruction. Oh, the amazing grace of God, who is rich in mercy, has set you and I today up as watchmen. He's done it all down through the ages, and lest any one of us be lulled to sleep. You know what's happening. We're being lulled to sleep. Some fall asleep rather quickly. I won't tell you who falls asleep rather quickly in my house, but there's three choices. We're being lulled to sleep in 2021. Folks, can I, I would love to preach a fancy, free, feel good, lovey dovey, let's just all hug one another message all the time. But I would be doing myself a disservice, and I would be doing you a disservice, and I would be disobedient to God's call as a preacher of the entire Word of God. I'd love to be the most popular dude on the block, but I'm just not. Y'all don't have to say amen. <laughs> but Romans chapter 13 and verse number 11 reminds us all, it's high time to awake. It's time to awake out of our sleep for our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Oh, my friends, we don't have a blank check on tomorrow. The Bible says, boast not thyself for tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. James says our life's like a vapor. We don't have a blank check. We don't have a guarantee of tomorrow. You say, well, you know what? I'm going to be a watchman tomorrow. Good luck with that. You remember the guy in Luke chapter 12 said, I'm going to build up my barns. I'm going to build bigger barns because I got all this stuff. And I'm going to store all my goods. And look at me. I'm big and look at all that I've done. <laughs> and God said, thou fool. You're a fool is what God said. He said, for tonight, thou, thou soul shall be required of thee. Oh, it's time that we wake up. We cannot watch if we're asleep on the job. I learned that very quickly in Camp Lejeune back in the 80s. Please don't make the mistake of falling asleep. It would be considered a dereliction of duty. And then lastly, as watchmen, <laughs> here it is, another high thought. We must warn. You got to watch. And you got to warn. Look back at verse number 3 of our text. Verse 3 says, If when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. We have a twofold duty. We're to diligently watch. And listen, if we see danger, and I think we see danger, we know the danger of not having a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
We know these dangers. And since we know these dangers, we're to warn people about the danger. Hosea in chapter 8, verse number 1, Hosea's, it says, Set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. Well, if you jump to the New Testament, the Bible is very clear in the New Testament. It just says it like this. In Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then when you get to Romans 6.23, it says the wages of sin is death. That should be enough to cause us to want to warn people. That should be enough to cause us to want to warn our family and our friends and our co-workers. Folks, it's not a fun message to share, but it's a needful message to share. Over in John chapter 3 and verse number 36, it was John the Baptist who proclaimed that according to God's plan and program of redemption, that a clear line had been drawn. He said there's a clear line that's been drawn. Notice what he says in John 3, 36. He says these words, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. God has entrusted you and I with the message of salvation. He's entrusted you. He considers you and me worthy of his trust to go out and to share his love. Not because we're so gifted, but because we're so blessed. He says, guess what? Go out and share that message with other people. In fact, Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 takes it a step further by saying, listen, it says this, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. There is no other name. There is no other way. And listen, I know the world wants to uh, believe that you can get to heaven this way, that way, or the other way. But it was Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It's pretty exclusive. But the beauty of that exclusive message is that it's very inclusive. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, my friends, Ephesians 1 and verse 7 says we have redemption through the blood, through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. We must, we must, we must be diligent to share, to warn people that a day is coming when they'll not have another opportunity. We have to tell them now. And listen, I understand God is sovereign, but that doesn't... uh, 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 take away our responsibility to share the gospel with people. Say, well, well, they'll just get saved. If God wants them to get saved, they're going to get saved. Guess what? He wants to use you and me to tell them about Jesus. We must warn our families and friends and co-workers and classmates, and you can keep the list going on and on. I'm reminded of that great hymn of yesterday, and it's a wonderful hymn. It says, sound the battle cry. See, the foe is nigh. Raise the standard high for the Lord. Gird your armor on. Stand firm, everyone. Rest your cause upon His holy word. The chorus is great. It says, rouse then, soldiers. Rally round the banner. Ready, steady. Pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout the loud hosanna. Christ is captain. I'm not captain. You're not captain. You're not in charge. Christ is captain of the mighty throng. Oh, it's time to sound the battle cry. True ministers. We are true ministers with a true message. We don't need to change the message. We don't need to water down. By the way, when you water down the message, people don't get a clear understanding of their soul's condition. It's, can I say, it's not easy. To watch and warn. Pastor, have you failed? Absolutely. Absolutely, I've failed. I have failed when the Holy Spirit has said, tell them. And I've said, Lord, I'll tell them next time. Anybody else done that or is it just me? You know the Holy Spirit's told you to tell somebody about Jesus and you've turned and said, no, not today. 
I got a birthday party I'm on my way to. I got little Bobby's got basketball practice or football practice or dance class or, or paintball or whatever else it is. I, I, I got my own plans today, Lord. Lord, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to go out and tell somebody tomorrow about Jesus. You know, it's like uh, that song Frank Sinatra used to sing years ago. Let's forget about tomorrow. Let's forget about tomorrow. Let's forget about tomorrow, for tomorrow never comes. See, we always put it off till tomorrow. We say, I'll watch and I'll warn tomorrow. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Oh, we must be diligent to go out as ministers of the gospel, as ambassadors to share the word of truth. And back in 2 Corinthians, I know I had you turn there earlier, but notice what it says. Remember, we stopped at the beginning of verse 20. It says, now therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. But what's the message that we really need to share with people? Well, the last part of verse 20 and 21 tells us, gives us a clear-cut message. It says, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. That's the message. We pray that you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. Why? For he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him or in Jesus. Oh, we need to be obediently sharing God's word with others while understanding that God is in charge of the results. Look with me at chapter 33. Again, look at verse 7 and following. Because I want you to see... Our job is to watch and warn, and we're given this illustration back in Ezekiel. Notice what it says, verse 7. It says, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Notice, God does the saving and the setting. He does the saving and the setting. And he says, Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth. That means you got to be regularly hearing the word of God. You can't just set up and say, well, I'll listen to the preaching and teaching of the Word of God once every six weeks. Not good enough. I'll just set up and listen and, and read and study and hear the preaching once every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Sometimes I'll do it and sometimes not good enough. We must be in God's Word every day. He says, look, he says, thou shalt hear the Word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, here's the result. Notice, God says, the wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at your hand. Wow. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, and if he does not turn from his way, he shall still die in his iniquity. Notice. But thou hast delivered thy soul. Friends, I put in my notes, the gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive to people. The gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive to people, but it is so necessary for people. It was offensive right after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Remember? The message was offensive. It was foolishness to the world at that time. The world today may look at you and say, that's a foolish message. The reality, though, is we're still charged with the task of telling them. You see, we warn them. We watch and we warn. So incredibly important that we know or that we go out as we watch and warn. It's incredibly important for other people to know that you actually have a genuine concern for them that you're just not checking off some box. Like, let me go over here. You need to be saved. You know you're a dirty, rotten sinner. Yeah, I, I told her. Let me go over here. <laughs> you know you're a dirty, rotten sinner. You, you definitely know. Your wife knows you need to be saved. I told him. Look at me, God. I'm just watching and warning everybody. No, you know what you, know what you are? You know what I am when I act like that? I'll just put it back on me. If that's the way I'm acting, I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. Because that person and that person says, he doesn't care about me. He doesn't love me. He's not concerned about my eternal security or my eternal destination. All he is is filling some kind of checkmark box out. His pastor told him to go tell me about Jesus, and so he told me about Jesus. 
Wasn't very loving when he did it. And by the way, I don't ever see him living for Jesus. So why would I want what he's saying he's got? I don't want to be like that. You see what's going to do a world of good? It's that we communicate the warning, but we do it in the way that Jesus told us to do it. In love. Speak the truth in love. Everyone. Oh, my friends, we have a job to do. Suffice it to say, our walk must match our talk. We are just sinners who have been saved by grace. We are just clay. When I wrote that down, I thought Andy's going to love this. We are just clay in the potter's hands. He is molding us and making us after his will. And one of the things he desires to do with us as clay, he desires that we conform more to the image of his dear son. He desires that we go out and that we share his word with those that need to hear it most. Remember, it's God's word and the spirit of God that changes lives, not us. I've seen a lot of people think, I, 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 I led somebody to Christ. Well, congratulations, Christ did the saving. Don't get our halo on too tight thinking you did anything. What you ought to say is, thank you, Jesus, for allowing me to have a part. Thank you for giving me the boldness and the courage to go and tell that person that you love them. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the fact that your word and your spirit worked in that person's heart and life and brought them to their knees, brought them to the point of salvation, just like Paul on the road to Damascus dropped in the sight of God. By the way, one of the greatest examples of a watchman that we ever find in Scripture is the Apostle Paul. His assessment of the gospel was pretty straightforward. You remember what he said? His assessment is pretty straightforward. In Romans 1, in verse number 16, Paul says, here's my assessment. Uh, it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. You remember he went on, he said, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He said, this is my assessment. He said it again to the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 1, in verse 18, Oh, listen, Paul not only said it, he believed it and he lived it. Everywhere he went, he told people about Jesus. And I remember reading in, in Bible college, I was in, uh, in a class called The Life of Paul, and we were going verse by verse through the book of Acts. And some of you in the harvesters class, we did that study uh, about a year and a half ago. We finished it now. And uh, I remember when we got to Acts chapter 20, and in Acts chapter 20, Paul is rushing, by the way, at this point. He's trying to get back to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And he knows that he wants to see his friends from the city of Ephesus. He wants to see these leaders once again, but he knows his flesh all too well. And so he doesn't stop at Ephesus. He has them sail on just south of Ephesus to Miletus. And when he gets to Miletus, he calls for the Ephesian elders to come and Paul wants to talk to the leaders once again before he makes his way to Jerusalem because Paul has already been kind of directed and guided and told by the Holy Spirit that he'll not be seeing them anymore. And so he wants to talk to them. And so he sends a messenger in Ephesus and says, Come, come and meet me where I am. I want to talk to you. And in Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse number 18, the elders come and Paul starts talking to them there. And he shares his heart with some very familiar friends. But as he's sharing his heart, he starts to share his heart and he bids them farewell. And it, it's such a beautiful passage of Scripture. And uh, I'm going to turn over. It's such a beautiful passage of Scripture. And as he gets there and they get there, he tells them, he talks about how he served the Lord in all humility and that he had served through tears and through temptations, which, by the way, had come because of the snares and and the scheme, so to speak, of the Jews uh, there at Ephesus. And, and so you drop down to verse number 26, and here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure. That word pure means innocent. He says, Wherefore I take unto you record this day, I am innocent. From the blood of all men, for I have shunned not to declare unto you all the counsel of God. In other words, Paul was saying, he's saying, my hands are clean. 
He says, my hands are clean. Think back to what Ezekiel, and, and he, it's kind of a reference back to Ezekiel 3 and Ezekiel 33. He says, my hands are clean. He says, I've been an ambassador. I've been the watchman. I've done exactly what God has called me to do. Folks, you and I are debtors of the sovereign grace of God. There's nothing, nothing, nothing that you or I could ever pay to replace it. And yet, according to His wisdom and goodness, God wants you and me to have a part in His ultimate plan to reach the world. That's crazy that God would want you and I to be a part of His plan. Honestly, my friends, and this may be a little bit alarming to you, but you and I are like smoke detectors. How many of you have a smoke detector in your home? Raise your hand, because if you don't, I'm turning you into Mark Butler over here, <laughs> our resident firefighter, and uh, he'll turn you in Channing. Where's Channing? We'll turn you over to Channing and Mark, and, and they'll get you set up. We're a lot like smoke detectors. The reality is, you see I've left it open right now as you start to put in your earplugs. But when a smoke detector has a working battery. It has two roles. It sits up on the ceiling. It has two roles. Number one, to detect smoke. Number two, to sound the warning. Now typically, if you're like most houses, this thing has a way also of letting you know when the batteries are running low. It typically happens at about 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. It's like the battery operator says, uh, it's 2.30. It's like my dad calling turkey. And then what we do in the dead of night, we get out with a stool and we go all through the house. No. No. When it sounds the alarm, you have two choices. See, it has two jobs. You and I have two jobs to watch and warn. By the way, the Bible says the wicked man or the wicked person. Don't get so high and mighty. That's us. We're wicked. We're ungodly. We're undeserving. When it does its job, we have two responses. We can either respond by getting up, maybe trying to find out where the fire is, putting out the fire, getting our family up, getting them out of the house, making a call to Mark or to Channing or, or Jay Byler or whoever we got a call to get the fire department on their way to save the lives of the people that are inside of the home or... Sorry. We can put our head back under the pillow and ignore it. But I dare say that if you ignore this alarm, chances are somebody might perish. We are watchmen. Not necessarily a popular role but a needful role. God said in Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse number 11, watch what he says one more time, say unto them as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? The application is clear for us today. We must, we must be diligent to watch and to warn. As frontline soldiers, I don't want to be a frontline soldier. Sorry, you are. 
As frontline soldiers, God has equipped us with a message. He has called us to carry that message to a lost and a dying world. That is our responsibility. I beg you, I implore you, I challenge you. As the pastor of this church, let's be busy watching and warning. Let's not just be some pretty building up here on the hill with a pretty new steeple. Let's be about the master's business. Let's go out and see lives change, not because we change lives, but because he changes lives. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the opportunity that we've had to be in your word today. And certainly, Lord, in a message like this, it's so important that if there's somebody in this room or somebody watching that has never called out upon the name of the Lord for the forgiveness of sin, that they would understand that that's exactly what the Lord desires. God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son so that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. God, that's the beautiful message. That's the gospel. So, Lord, I pray that if there's somebody in this room, somebody watching online that has never trusted in Jesus, God, please, please, through your spirit, through your word, I pray that you've spoken to their heart and that their desire would to be right now, right now, as I'm praying, to call upon the name of the Lord. It's not really difficult. It's not about a prayer. It's about the, the change that takes place in somebody's heart. The understanding that they're going one way and they understand that they're going the wrong way and they repent, turn, and receive Christ as Savior. Oh, it's one stop shopping at the foot of the cross. Oh, Lord, I pray that you'll save souls right now, even in our midst. Maybe you're here and you're listening to me and you say, Pastor, I've never prayed. I've never called up on the name of the Lord for the forgiveness of my sins. Would you do it right now? Would you just do it by simply saying, Lord, please forgive me. Please, I, nobody had to tell me that I'm a sinner, but Lord, I understand now that you truly desire to have a relationship with me. I believe you are who you say you are, that you were born of a virgin, you lived a sinless life, you died on an old rugged cross, you were buried in a borrowed tomb. The Bible says that you arose three days later, conquering death, hell, and the grave. Lord, I trust you and you alone for the forgiveness of sin. I trust you and I, I'm asking you to come into my life as the Lord and Savior of my life. That's your desire and that's your prayer this morning. Would you just look at me? I just want to celebrate that decision. You say, I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. God bless you. Somebody say, I really desire to have, God bless you. Somebody else say, I really, really, really ask the Lord to forgive me today as my Savior. Maybe you're watching online, and that's you today. You've never thought about it. You've, you've heard a lot about the Lord, but you've never called out upon the name of the Lord. If that's you, would you just simply contact us? Let us know. Put a comment up there that you trusted Christ today. Oh, what a blessing that would be. Maybe you're here this morning, and you said, Pastor, I just need, I need strength. I need boldness. I need courage to watch and to warn would you pray for me that I would be more faithful in the days ahead to execute the duties of a watchman? If that's you, would you just look at me and say, Pastor, just pray for me that I'd be more faithful. God bless you. God bless you. Hands, faces everywhere. You don't have to raise your hand. Just look at me. Ser if you're serious for God, he He'll work in your life. Say, I want to be more faithful. I want to tell people about Jesus. I know I only have this one life. God bless you. God faces everywhere. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Oh, we only have this one life. Let's live it for Jesus. Father, we thank you. We thank you for how you've worked on our hearts and in our lives in the past. And Lord, I thank you for the decisions this morning. I thank you for the desire of your people to, to really be, uh, be willing to walk in your strength and your wisdom and to be able to uh, draw their strength and their courage from you, Lord, that they might do a better job at watching and warning. Lord, we all need to do a better job. Lord, I pray that you will just continue to bless us, continue to use us. God, continue to use this church 
as a beacon of your love and your light in this area, God, that we might see more souls come to know Christ as their Savior, that we might see more families restored, that we might see your hand moving in the midst of this church, that we might see more people back in your word, praying on their knees, that we might see more people serving you with all of their heart, with all of their soul, and with all of their mind. Oh, Lord, how we need you to work. Lord, we thank you for how you started it this morning. God, I pray that you'll be honored and glorified by the things that we'll do throughout the remainder of this day and in the coming days. We give you the praise for it all in the precious name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen and amen. Would you stand with me? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to sing a song of invitation. But if you're serious and you really, really desire, now I know this is bold. This is part of asking God to give you courage. If you're really serious and you want to warn people about Jesus, you want to do a better job, I'm going to go over here and I'm just going to pray. The altar's open. I'm asking you to come and ask God to just give you strength. Say, I know it's a bold move. You say, well, what if somebody watches me? I'd rather God watch me. Right? If you're not, if, in fact, as we sing, I would just encourage you. You know, keep your heads bowed. It's a private time. But I want to open up the altars. If you're serious about being a better watchman and, and doing a better job at warning people about His love and His truth, I'm going to ask you to come. You could space out around here, socially distance, as unto the Lord. Let's do it. Let's give it all to Jesus. God bless you as you come. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. Would you sing that chorus with us one more time? My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. Oh, the grace of Jesus. Saved a wretch like me. Oh, thank you guys for being here today. It's not always uh, easy to preach a message like this, but I pray that uh, we would understand that we all need to be sifted every once in a while, as I heard this morning, reminded that part of our discipleship journey is clearing away the clutter, clearing away the things that don't need to be in our life so that we would refocus on what's most important, really. I love you guys, and I'm thankful for you. I pray for you all the time. I'm so thankful to see some of you again. It's 
2020 and 2021 has been difficult. Not being able to see family. Not being able to be around family. And uh, your family. Really the only family that we really have known uh, in this regard. I mean, we, we're out of Battlefield. Battlefield is part of us. And uh, we went away to be trained and we came back. This is, this is our family. And so I'm thankful that you're here. And I look forward to seeing you. I encourage you to be out on Wednesdays if you're able. Man, we had a good group Wednesday night. And uh, that was amazing, and we still have room for you on Wednesday night. We're able to space out. I mean, we had people all the way spaced out. It was really amazing Wednesday night. And so, excuse me, I encourage you to make, uh, take up that opportunity for your spiritual nourishment uh, as the Lord gives you that opportunity. Have a great day. Have a great rest of your week.